I think we'll start because I think you've got some really interesting speakers and we've got, we want to jam as much in as possible. So good evening, everybody, or good afternoon if you are not in GMT time. And my name is Professor Jo Crotty and I'm the director of, for the Institute of Social Responsibility at Chill University. We established the Institute in 2019 to look at all aspects, the broadest conceptualization of social responsibility. And we have a number of affiliated research centres, including one that is facilitating this webinar this afternoon. And that is the Institute, is the Centre for um, Racism Research. So the title of the webinar this afternoon is An End in the Beginning, Race Relations and the United States, the Trump Legacy and the Biden Presidency. So in the dying embers of the Trump administration, I'm going to hand over to James Renton, who is the co-director for the Centre for Racism Research, to introduce our speakers and to kick us off. Over to you, James. Thank you so much, Joe. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, so as Joe was saying, uh, I'm the uh, co-director of the International Centre on Racism at Edge Hill. Um, the other co-director is Dr. Jenny Barrett, who I'm very happy to say is with us uh, today or this morning, to be specific, um, with our friends in the United States. Uh, the International Centre on Racism, uh, we were launched uh, in 2019, uh, but we came out of a, a, a decade of activity at Edge Hill, uh, dealing with questions of, of race, racism and ethnicity. And throughout that time and the birth of the centre has been uh, within the context, uh, not just of the presidency of Donald Trump, um, but all of the, uh, the bigger structural factors that gave birth to the possibility of having a President Trump in the White House. Um, the mission of our centre is to uh, engage with the whole diverse range of racisms globally. And um, it's an unfortunate point to make that uh, from the moment that we started our, our work in 2008, coinciding with the crash, um, that there's been a, a rise across the board uh, globally in all racisms. Um, and it's a very interesting feature of the, the, the Trump presidency that uh, one of the racisms that we deal with in our center is anti-Semitism, uh, which for all sorts of reasons for a long time has tended to have its own community of scholars uh, separate uh, from other scholar communities of scholars dealing with different racisms. And one of our aims is to bring the study of anti-Semitism together with the study of other racisms. Um, and it was an assumption, uh, certainly my own assumption and many colleagues, uh, that the uh, fight against anti-Semitism and the fight against other racisms had also become uh, separated and that we we're dealing with different constituencies, people who were um, anti-Semites and people who were perpetrators of other racisms. And uh, I, I was involved in a big project uh, that was led at Edge Hill, uh, looking at the relationship between anti-Semitism and Islamophobia through history from medieval times to the present. And one of the key arguments of that book was that at a certain point, anti-Semitism and Islamophobia diverged. And indeed, anti-Semitism and other racisms diverged. And that uh, this happens particularly after the Second World War uh, for a whole host of factors. And then Donald Trump's presidency arrived and suddenly it was quite clear that the, uh, the, his constituency uh, were just as likely to be virulent anti-Semites as uh, they were to be Islamophobes or anti-Black racists. And that by itself uh, really upset the apple cart. And, and it made us think as scholars uh, in all sorts of ways, but that go well beyond Donald Trump as an individual um, into much bigger structural factors. Um, we are talking today about a very specific context, and that is the context of the United States for all of its connections with global trends since 2008 and long before. Um, and it's my uh, great honor and pr privilege to introduce 
the person uh, whose idea it was to, to hold this discussion, uh, Professor Kevin Verney, who is um, the Associate Head of Research in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Edgehill University. Uh, and but dare I say it more importantly, the senior historian of black civil rights um, and questions of race at Edgehill University and a mentor to a great many of us. Um, and it's a real uh, privilege to, to work with him and uh, for me to be able to introduce him. And I shall now hand over to Professor Verney. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, well, <clears throat> thanks very much for that uh, introduction, James. And uh, depending on uh, where you're joining us from, I guess it's uh, both uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Um, and uh, if I can also uh, introduce our, our three uh, distinguished speakers this evening. Uh, first of all, we have uh, Whitney uh, Battle Baptiste, who is a professor in the Department of Anthropology in the University of Massachusetts. She's a historical archeologist who focuses primarily on the historical intersection of race, class, and gender in the shaping of cultural landscapes across the African diaspora. And she has worked at uh, some of the most uh, well-known historic sites uh, in both North and South United States, uh, including the home of Andrew Jackson in uh, Tennessee, and also uh, the uh, W.E.B. Du Bois uh, home site in uh, Great Barrington, Massachusetts. Our second panelist is uh, Jean Beeman, who's an Associate Professor of Sociology at the University of uh, California in Santa Barbara. Her research is uh, ethnographic in nature and focuses on race, ethnicity, racism, international migration, and state-sponsored violence in both France and the United States. And she has written uh, extensively uh, on those range of subjects. Uh, our third panelist, uh, Heidi Byrick, is a co-founder of the Global Project Against Hate and Extremism, which has a mission to strengthen and educate a diverse global community committed to exposing and countering racism, bigotry, and prejudice, and to promote the human rights values that support flourishing, inclusive societies and democracies. Uh, she is a, a leading authority on uh, American and European extremist movements, and uh, prior to her current post, uh, she led the uh, Southern Law Poverty Center's Intelligence Project, which is the, the foremost organization uh, tracking hate and extremism movements uh, in the United States. So very much welcome to our three panelists this evening. Uh, for those of you in the audience, um, uh, if you can submit questions on chat and uh, later on I'll try to see if I can sort of compile those questions for you. Uh, but to begin with, perhaps with uh, a few sort of more general questions and uh, looking back, of course, uh, at uh, Barack Obama's uh, first inauguration uh, in 2009, uh, when Joe Biden uh, became a vice president of the United States. Uh, at that time, there was a, an awful lot of uh, optimistic public and media speculation that the United States was now a post-racial society. So I guess the, the first question, which I will ask each of you in turn, is uh, how and why did we get from that point uh, to where we are today? And uh, we go around about the screen uh, in a kind of clockwise direction from my perspective. If I could be begin there with, with Whitney. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, and uh, yes, it is morning here. It's the morning before the um, inauguration of um, Joe Biden. But this idea of a post-racial society, um, when it happened as, as a person of African descent, it was extremely interesting because it was almost as if um, the news told us it was a post-racial, or the media was the, was, the, was the one who told us the message. Um, many of us living, um, I'm in the Northeast and um, the idea of post-racial because of the placement of Barack Obama was, not necessarily reflected on the ground in every day. Um, Post-racial, I believe to me, when I first heard it was kind of in some ways a replacement for um, colorblind, um, which means that in some ways I don't see color when I see you, which means you don't see me. You don't see that I am 
who I am and I am very purposefully in how I move through this country and the world. And so post-racial was again, something I felt was really media generated and then it, it expanded to then include you know, scholars such as myself who were writing against it, some wrote in favor of it and all these different kinds of variations. But it was just a replacement in many ways, I think for a language of kind of to, to downplay the practice of anti-blackness within the United States. And so for me, it's, 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 it's much more media hype than actually um, me believing that, that Barack Obama was the beginning of the end of, of racism as we knew it. So that's my. Okay, uh, thanks very much. And now I can ask the same question to Jean. Yes, thank you so much. Um, thanks so much for the invitation. I'm really happy to be here with you all. Uh, good morning from California. Um, so I, would, I completely agree with everything Whitney uh, just said. I think the thing that I would add is, um, you know, one, a couple points. One, I would say part of the way that we just literally answer the question of how we got here, um, both sort of literally and figuratively, is that we've never sort of grappled with or fully recognized the, you know, the, the state of white supremacy and racism in our society. And I say that to say that, you know, just again, to piggyback on what Whitney just articulated very, very, very aptly, which is that because we haven't reconciled with this history, with the ongoing practices and patterns of white supremacy in our society, we therefore think that just electing a black president is going to immediately solve 400 plus years of oppression, right? And so the only reason why we have that narrative, as Whitney notes, that it was sort of propagated in the media, is because we haven't fully grappled with our history and how it reflects our present, how it continues today. The second point I'll quickly mention to answer the question is that I also think if we think in the long durée of, of U.S. history, uh, we shouldn't be so surprised that we would have Barack Obama and then um, and then Trump. If we think about the way that there's always a sort of you know two steps forward, one step back kind of arc to U.S. history as it relates to racial progress, so we can think about you know. Reconstruction followed by Jim Crow. We can think about the civil rights we've been followed by the war on drugs and various sort of uh, repressive policies in the 1970s. And so I think in that sense, this we're always seeing a different um, uh, manifestation of that same pattern of sort of any sort of you know advancement that was achieved during the presidency of Barack Obama and, and Joe Biden automatically is met with a, a backlash and was what we've seen in the last four years. Okay. If you have to ask the same question to Heidi. Well, I, I don't think I can say it much better than Gene and Whitney <laughs> just expressed it. You know, uh, it's interesting that Whitney talks about the, the media narrative. When I heard all the talk about a post-racial America, you know, in 2008, late 2008, early 2009, what I kept thinking is this is like some kind of conservative put up job to act like now that we've, you know, we've got a black man in the White House, this is the end of all the terrible things. And maybe, you know, to some extent there were, you know, privileged white people who were using these terms as a way to say that this country doesn't have the horrific legacy of, ra you know, ongoing racism and hatred and so on. And, you know, of course I was very happy that Obama was elected. This is a huge, huge moment in American history. It doesn't wipe away the past. And, you know, in, in the 10 or so days after Obama was elected, we saw this huge outburst of hate crimes, Black churches being burned down, Black people being attacked. And you just knew that this naive narrative was ridiculous. And that what we were in for really, and of course what Obama experienced was a massive backlash, white backlash against his um, time in office. And just like Gene said, you could, you know, I didn't see it because I guess I couldn't imagine somebody like as crazy as Trump coming in there, but it really kind of, it was actually very much predictable, right? That it would be an extreme, someone who would represent the extremes of white supremacist culture that would follow um, Obama's time in office. So, you know, what happened with Obama being elected is once again, it made clear how deeply troubled the United States is when it comes to racism, white supremacist culture, and so on. Okay, th thanks very much for that. And uh, if I could just remind any uh, members of the audience who may have joined us uh, you know, slightly late that um, 
We will be taking questions from the audience as well. So uh, if you want to type in any questions that you have uh, on uh, the, the chat option, uh, then I'll try to collate those and uh, pass them on to our, to our panelists a little later on. But um, I guess uh, having begun by looking back at um, uh, Barack Obama's inauguration in 2009, if we do come perhaps a little bit more up to date, uh, I guess one of the things that's probably in all our minds is uh, the recent occupation of the Capitol building in Washington by our uh, Trump supporters. And I guess there's, there's two questions perhaps there is, uh, the first one is that to what extent do you think that that was racially motivated? And uh, why do you think that the police response to that occupation was uh, rather different to that for earlier Black Lives Matter protests in Washington? So perhaps we go the other way around this time. So if I begin with Heidi. I mean, look, that what happened at the Capitol was a white riot. There's just, there's no way around it. If you look at the groups that were involved, there were lots of white supremacists, neo-Nazis, members of militias, which during um, the period that Trump has been in office have become quite racialized, in particular anti-immigrant and anti-Muslim. Then you had, you know, lots of people who adhere to this QAnon business, right? This crazy conspiracy theory, which is riven through with strains of anti-Semitism and other forms of hatred. I mean, what the problem with what happened at the Capitol is it shows that Trump has been able to consolidate a movement that includes, includes all kinds of forms of far-right extremism, as well as a decent chunk of conservatives, right? It's infiltrated its way into the, into the Republican Party. And now you see a Trump supporter who may consider themselves not racial. I'm not saying that they aren't. I think this whole thing is riven through by race. Standing, you know, arm in arm with a white supremacist. And this is a, it's a pretty scary development. And it shows that um, we have radicalized a large chunk of people on the far right. And look, as far as the police response, there is just no way that if the people storming the Capitol were black folks or Muslims, that we would have gotten this response. We, we all know there's over policing problems in this country. We've seen what happened during the Black Lives Matter protests and how cops treated uh, those events. And, you know, it's just shocking. But don't, don't forget, we had militias take over the Malheur Wildlife Refuge a few years ago, a bunch of white older men. And that wasn't treated in the same way. The Bundy Ranch standoff with anti-government extremists wasn't treated the same way. But the color of your skin determines how you were policed in this country. And that's what we saw at the Capitol as well. Okay, and I can put the same question to Jean. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I would just add two quick points. One, I think, is the question of legitimacy and which protests or which sort of complaints, if you will, are seen as legitimate. And so I think, you know, among everything that uh, Heidi just said, I think what the insurrection also showed is that, you know, white citizens, white Americans, their, their critiques, their criticisms are legitimate. So their critiques of the election that was fair, quote unquote, that's legitimate. They're, they're allowed to sort of protest against the state. I mean, the nation state in this case, they're allowed to protest on the Capitol. That is also as legitimate in a way that the Black Lives Matter movement that has been around for years has never had that same kind of credibility or legitimacy because we've never seen Black Lives Matter. Uh, we, well, well, one, we don't generally see Black Americans as fully American, which is sort of the point of Black Lives Matter among other things. But you know, also we don't see the sort of critiques or the sort of uh, demands to not be killed by the police as legitimate demands, as credible demands, the same way that we do people who support Trump. And so I think automatically you have a different sort of framework to understand the people who are doing the protesting, if you will. Um, the second point I would quickly add is, you know, I'm thinking about this, I was thinking about the insurrection, particularly in light of sort of the, um, the, the, the anniversary of the birthday of Martin Luther King and thinking about how he would have responded to these events. And I think, you know, among other things, I think he would have rightly critiqued these in the insurrection as a white supremacist insurrection, but he also would have reminded us, and I think it's point to, to put this sort of on the table, is the role of the white moderate, right? So it's the idea that not everyone's, you know, literally storming the Capitol, but that doesn't mean that, you know, white America in general is not implicated in a lot of what we've seen with this insurrection. So I think it's helpful to sometimes think beyond sort of just the actual literal people who are protesting and thinking about the broader frameworks. And I'll, I'll stop there. 
Okay, and if, uh, uh, ask the same question for Whitney. I think that um, Heidi and Jean have just laid out so much, but what I'd like to bring attention to is actually a little nuanced in the sense that for me, what was, I don't know what was so uh, visceral, it just, it, just it, it made me nauseous, first of all, because I was in the process of listening to the arguments. Um, I was watching C-SPAN and I'm watching because I wanted to see the arguments, not hear the interpretations of the arguments um, from Republicans about why they were challenging this count, which is a ritual it's already a done deal. We know who the president elect is, and this is a process. More than three times in, 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 in way too short a span of time, I heard um, congressmen referring to 19, uh, sorry, 19, 1876, which marks the end of reconstruction. And as, as you know, to me, it was like the first slap in the face was, this was a compromise in the United States for Southern states. See, the idea of reconstruction was to actually reincorporate the treasonous South back into the union that makes up the United States. And then so shortly after I'm hearing about how the compromise, which literally compromised not only the safety, the lives, the importance of black and indigenous people, um, it, 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 then I look up and there's someone holding the Confederate flag in the Capitol. My state, not just the state, the, the, the government, the seat of the government. I've been in that building. It is something that I'm supposed to hold sacred even though we can argue about the rights of, of, of black and indigenous folks in the constitution. You know, We made it in there, but not quite fully human first. But this idea, that you're invoking what ended reconstruction, which would have possibly made some sense of equality or, or, or even some sense that, that, that black Americans especially were fully human in the eyes of the law and the constitution, but the Confederate flag was being held. The, the, the flag that's treasonous, the flag that was against the United States and it, it, it just, it just, it, it, it hurt me, but it reminded me that in many, play, in many ways that insurrection was a reminder of my place in this country, that, that, you know, I'm, that, you know, my, my, my homeland, because I'm, I'm both black and indigenous, but I am racialized as black in this country. But the idea that the idea that that Confederate flag and people were in there desecrating what is problematic, but as a, an, as, as, as a United Statesian, I believe that I can critique my government. I believe that I can go into the Capitol building and, and look at a, a painting of a, of, a, of a Confederate person and say, I don't like that, I don't like that man, but at least, in the sense of a true government that I believe that is based on this constitution, it is my right, as, as James Baldwin said, to constantly critique the country that I love. But that Confederate flag and that constant um, remembrance of 1876 as if it was a great moment was really a slap in the face for me. And I think a lot of Americans of African descent really saw that as just testimony, let, let alone the ways in which the police interacted with those insurrection, um, domestic terrorists and rioters. I, I, I would like to use all of those terms in referring to them. So I just wanted to bring up that Confederate flag that was in our capital. Yeah, I certainly think that was one of the, was the images, was it? That the guy carrying that Confederate flag was one of the ones that circulated around, uh, around the world. And uh, a way, in a way, I think that perhaps leads on to my uh, next question, which perhaps I could address specifically to Heidi, which is that um, following the presidential debates and, uh, and the capital occupation, uh, certainly I got on this side of the, the Atlantic, we, we've all become familiar with a group known as the Proud Boys. Um, but how, how significant do you think the rise of uh, white supremacist uh, groups like the Proud Boys 
has, has been under Trump and, and what perhaps can we expect uh, to, to take place now uh, in the Biden presidency? Well, you know, Trump has emboldened the radical right in it just, I, I don't even know how to express it. I mean, we have more organizations, you know, including the Proud Boys, they came in the Trump era. We have, um, you know, white supremacist ideas that have infiltrated the mainstream, a lot of the anti-immigrant policies that we've seen, uh, xenophobic, Muslim ban. I mean, I could go on. These are things that really came from hate groups, literally were written up by hate groups. Build the Wall was something David Duke was talking about, for example, in the 1970s. Um, you know, I saw the Capitol assault a little bit as a bookend to what happened in Charlottesville, where in 2017, we saw all these white supremacists and militia types um, on the streets of Charlottesville, you know, killed Heather Heyer, an anti-racist activist. And they weren't there because they were upset with their government. They were there because they were excited about their government under Trump, you know, uh, Trump's messaging to these organizations through and people through Twitter and social media also built their ranks, um, added new users. I mean, I could complain about what the tech companies have not done to stop, you know, to tamp these things down. But Trump's era has been very important to growing a movement that it looks like might be, you know, several million people now. The um, polling shows about 20 million Americans thought what happened uh, at the Capitol was a good thing. And a little bit more than that, thought that they saw themselves reflected in the people who stormed the Capitol and the insurrection. Uh, so we've got an, an even more radicalized faction of the white population in the United States that we did not have anymore. And these are the same people and ideas that lead to hate crimes, domestic terrorism, undermining our democratic institutions, all of that is now inflamed and larger than it was four years ago. And, you know, the Biden administration is, has got a challenge on its hand with these issues. I mean, one of the most astounding things for me too was the level of uh, military folks who were up there in the Capitol. Uh, we've got to, you know, we've got to get rid of extremism in the military. We've got to deal with white supremacy and police forces. We have to take seriously the threat of domestic terrorism to folks of color in this country. I mean, the list is quite long and it's gonna require its own, I think, agenda line for the administration to take this seriously. And that's only dealing with the radicalized people. That's not dealing with the general white supremacist culture, racism, <laughs> every form that invades our politics and institutions. So it's, it's, a, it's a big deal. Dealing with the violence and, and the most extreme factions is critically important. But we've just got tons and tons of problems in this country when it comes to race that have never been resolved, never been addressed. And as you know, Gene and Whitney have talked about, the, the history of not doing what's right is really astounding in this country. Okay, and I guess that, that, that kind of problem, of course, is uh, reflected also in the, the, the reemergence of the, the Black Lives Matter movement uh, under the, the Trump presidency. And uh, the rise of Black Lives Matter process and tragic incidents, and there's really been a, you know, a, a terrible litany of deaths from Trayvon Martin uh, under Barack Obama through to, uh, to George Floyd under, under President Trump. Uh, but they've all highlighted very serious concerns about police practices. So perhaps if I could ask uh, Whitney and Jean, uh, you know, why do you think we, there's been so many high profile cases like this in, in recent years? And, and what can be done to address them? So perhaps if I could give them with Whitney. I thought Jean was gonna take that one. <laughs> um, I think that um, I think that the 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 cell phone is probably the cell phone slash social media has been one way in which some of these cases become high profile. Yet, um, unfortunately, I think that this is not, these high profile cases are not, they're just the ones that we know about that get spread. There are, there's deaths every day. Um, and the, it's hard to talk about, you know, um, 
for for me, it, it, it's state sanctioned violence. It's it's the ways in which um, military equipment becomes the equipment uh, or becomes the go-to for police um, who are, we, we, I didn't see tanks, right? During the, the, the insurrection or the, the, the peaceful protest outside of uh, the Capitol building uh, last Wednesday or around the Capitol building. I think that the fact that Black Lives Matter, you know, was born at the acquittal of George Zimmerman who murdered Trayvon Martin and it came to kind of an explosion at the, the murder of uh, uh, Michael Brown in Ferguson. And the thing is, is that I, I, I really want to reiterate, if we're talking about politics, we now have, because of Trump, because of the, the highlighting of, of these murders of, of Black folks and the inability to convict police, um, especially um, in the case of Breonna Taylor, which is constantly on my mind. Um, but this idea that, that, that we have Congresswoman um, or Senator Cori Bush from Ferguson, we have a new generation of younger people who have been influenced and or been a part of the BLM movement who are now seeing they're or, or moving and pushing to get into the legislature. So they're, they're in the Senate, they're in the House. And the, the truth is, is that I, BLM is not going away, but BLM is alive because of the inability for us to separate death um, to, I don't know how to, I, it, it, it's so much, it's, it's complicated and it gets, gets me choked up because I do have two, you know, uh, black sons that I'm raising in this country, and the idea is that this happens every day. This, the idea is that Black Lives Matter is necessary because of the inability for us to stop the ways in which black folk are policed in this country. Um, and at the on the same end of that, I have heard many on the other side of that talk about Blue Lives Matter and how police, without police, we would have chaos and we would have, you know, we, these, there, there are criminals that are occupying our jails. When we know that these are not, our, our, our prison industrial complex is a major um, um, uh, gross national product at this point. That's, that's what it is. We fill prisons and prisons pay. And the ideas behind knowing that children have this pipeline in which they are going to go to prison, it also means that our schools and other institutions are run as precursors to people going into uh, uh, young black and indigenous and people of color folks going into prison. And um, the fact that in so many states, marijuana is legal, yet there are still people in jail for marijuana charges. It are, it are those kinds of inequalities that makes BLM a necessity, but at the same time, thankfully there is some attention that is brought to the death and the murder and, and but the fact that we cannot convict a police officer for these crimes is, is testament to BLM not going anywhere anytime soon. Okay, and if I can pass that same question to Jean and, and perhaps Jean as well, you know, are there things that could be done to reform police practices? I mean, one of the things that's often mentioned, you know, something like dealing with implicit racial bias. So how do we address these problems? Yeah, thank you. Um, and I completely concur with, uh, with everything Whitney said, particularly her, her focus or emphasis on the sort of macro level dimensions creating this problem. Um, I would say first, um, you know, we think about Black Lives Matter as a movement as part of a long history, I mean, I think we should, as part of a long history towards uh, struggles for Black liberation, struggles for Black humanity, then it sort of makes sense that 
that Black Lives Matter is just a current manifestation of what's been happening in this country for 400 years. And related to that, I think when we think about these high profile incidents, we have to keep in mind that, you know, these are like, as Brittany said, these are the ones that we know about. There's a question of visibility, right? And so there's a way in which the various different technologies, we know of more of these high profile incidents of Black folks being killed by the police. But, you know, also that also is not new. Um, you know, I remember the Rodney King beating, right? You know, over 30, 20 years, 1992, right? So again, that was also seen as another sort of, you know, uh, watershed moment for understanding anti-Black violence. But of course, we're still dealing with the same kind of anti-Black violence, just visualized with different technologies. Um, and I think the other thing I would add to the question of sort of what do we do? I mean, I think it's very clear in a lot of social science literature that implicit bias training is really ineffective for addressing institutional racism, right? I mean, it, it just, I mean, there's like, you know, that's a whole soapbox for a different time, but it's really not sufficient for dealing with actual structural issues. It's sort of, you know, yeah, I don't actually know what it's sufficient to do, frankly, but I'm not a fan. But the point being is that I don't think it's gonna address these issues. I do think that we need to think about Think more, think more radically about solutions. So in that sense, I'm very much um, in, in favor of the movement to defund the police um, and to think broadly in the ways in which we've already used the, or we currently use the police as a solution to all social problems, or all social ills, and what might it look like to imagine different solutions, different possibilities, right? And so not calling the police for every little thing that comes up, which I think in a lot of cases, a lot of these high profile incidents, is, is what leads to the deaths of these black individuals in the first place, all right? So how might we think more holistically as a society to address our social problems outside of the police infrastructure that exists? Okay, uh, thanks for that. And we, we've now got some questions from the audience as well. So if I can perhaps combine a couple of questions from the audience. Well, one of the questions that we've had is, uh, you know, what do you think was the role of Republican members of Congress uh, during the Trump presidency in not speaking out sufficiently uh, against um, you know, some of his statements, say, you know, Charlottesville or the occupation of the Capitol building? Uh, and I guess one kind of thinks, you know, Lindsey Graham was kind of one moment, for example, was saying, you know, this is it, this is where, uh, you know, uh, I, I cash my chips, but then the next day was on the plane with, with Trump to the border wall. Uh, so what do you think is the role of Republican members of Congress in, in, in uh, sustaining Trump? And uh, what does Trump's legacy mean for the future of the Republican Party? So perhaps if I could begin with Heidi for, with that one. Well, <laughs> Obviously, the extent of sort of anti-democratic racist behavior has seeped deep into the Republican Party lately. But when I think about Republicans, I think about the fact, and this is maybe just reflects my age, that Ronald Reagan's first campaign stop before his 1980 run was in Philadelphia, Mississippi, and he was not there to honor the civil rights workers who died. He was there to play the Southern strategy, which is get whites to be disaffected from the Democratic Party because they're upset about civil rights and bring them into the Republican Party and build majorities. You know, we have had less and more overt racism coming from Republicans over the years, but we didn't get to Trump without that, that trend, that building of that particular political formulation. So, you know, the other thing about the modern current Republican Party is a lot of political science research shows that it's a whole lot more like a radical right party in Europe, like the Front National or the Alternative for Deutschland in Germany. It is not some kind of a moderate, you know, center right party. It's actually a pretty radicalized party at this point. And so, you know, Trump may have taken them a little further down the road in this way, but race has sat, has sat at the bottom of the way Republicans motivate voters for a very long time. And, and you know, there is going to be a battle, obviously, over whether Trump did great damage to that party or the Trump base is going to take over that party. But the issue of racism and how it undergirds Republican politics is a serious one. And, and it needs to be confronted. I have very little hope that anybody in the Republican Party is going to be involved in addressing those issues. I just, I can't see it, right? McDonnell, I mean, uh, McConnell was uh, very Machiavellian using Trump to get Christian right judges onto the bench. And I just, I, you know, 
it would be a fantastic thing if that changed in the Republican Party, but I just, I can't see how that's going to happen. In fact, what I think is going to happen is they're going to move further to the right as they continue to pander to a shrinking base. And it's going to be up to all the rest of us in this country to create a diverse, multi-racial, multicultural uh, government, because I just don't think that there's anything that can be done to stop that rot in the Republican Party. Okay, and if I can move on to Whitney and perhaps pick up what Hardy was saying there about the shrinking Republican base. Uh, what what does that perhaps mean for the Republican Party in the sense that you know America is clearly going through a process of demographic change. It's becoming a more diverse society uh, by 2040 or uh, something like that. Predictions are that white Americans will be less than 50% uh, of the population. So is that really a kind of crisis for the future of the Republican Party dealing with, with Trump's legacy if, if it pursues that strategy that he's followed? I mean, yes. I mean, it, it, it's, it's interesting as a, as a native New Yorker and, and someone who has heard of Trump my whole life, I guess. Um, I, didn't, I didn't realize he was Republican until he ran for president. <laughs> um, and it's really interesting how this idea of holding the Republican Party hostage and how so many of um, so many the, the, this idea of this fear factor that Republicans have to go against the president. And and to me, um, I am extremely excited, uh, you know, uh, uh, about the first uh, black and South Asian woman to be the vice president, not just because I'm in the same sorority as she is in, but the idea that we will have a diverse uh, um, running uh, ticket in terms of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. But at the same time, I, I have to admit, I'm, I'm less excited about the moderateness of the Democratic Party and the inability to call out and not cancel culture, but the idea of calling and really talking in and being honest about the ways in which the Republican Party is, as Heidi referred to it as the, the rotting, because it is rotting from inside out. And the truth is, is that I'm not sure if, if I don't know if Trump will disappear. I don't have faith that he will, but at the same time, I think about that 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 dwindling base, as Heidi also referred to, and 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 keep thinking, and I and I always ask, who who is this base? Like, I feel like it's this amorphous, um, racialized, uh, pro police. It, it just it keeps morphing and changing about who occupies that kind of persona. As, as the mythological base that is Trump's um, support system. And, and, and that desperation is based on the fact of what you just talked about. The, the, the truth is, is that, you know, I, I, I already refer to myself as a part of the global majority, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm not a minority. And, and more and more, we look at, at the people again, who are coming into office, going into local um, 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 uh, you know, positions, the fact that a state as red and Southern and conservative as Georgia elected a, uh, a, a Jewish and a black um, senator and, and also voted for, for the Biden um, presidency, um, for Biden to become president is a reflection of our demographic changes. It is a reflection of we are now, but my fear is that we are now going to begin to understand the competition between rural and urban, right? And how these are, are, are the new ways in which to differ, differentiate um, the, the certain voting block that is Republican, but Republican in the sense of I want to take my gun into Congress because I have to defend myself, Republican, which is an interesting kind of shift because if, if when you looked at the ways in which the, um, the, the, the voting went, especially on January 5th, 
there were all of these rural areas were completely Republican, completely red, but it was Jordan, it was Atlanta proper and surrounding areas that completely overtook that state. And I think that that, rur that rural and urban dichotomy that's happening is also kind of a problem that is going to become a bigger problem down the road. I don't know what, I'm not a political scientist, but for me, it was just so interesting to see the ways in which urban populations, not just black people in Atlanta, but everybody that was a part of that base were about the kind of the democratic way of thinking and wanting to move us from this extreme air, this extreme right that we were going. And the idea is that we have to keep in mind that over 70 million people did vote for this man, as in Trump. So there are still many, many people who either don't like Joe Biden, don't want to vote for a Democrat, or see Trump as the only alternative in terms of the Republican option. Okay, then I can move to Jean, and perhaps one, one of the, the ironies, uh, of course, we've heard an awful lot about Trump in recent uh, weeks and months about uh, how the election has been stolen and it, he really won. And, but I, I guess one of the things that's been associated with Republican state administrations in particular uh, since uh, about 2014 uh, is uh, attempts at voter suppression, which have uh, disproportionately impacted on uh, minority ethnic uh, communities. So uh, I, I perhaps, what if you could perhaps you know, talk a little bit about that because maybe our audience might not be uh, quite so familiar with that. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, I can say about that and also just sort of pick up on some of the previous threads. Um, I think, you know, I, at the risk of being, of sounding very cynical, I actually don't think the Republican Party is shrinking. I don't think Trump's base is going away. Um, and so, and I say that for a few reasons uh, that sort of, and some of which relate to voter suppression. One, I think, you know, uh, 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 demography is not destiny, right? And so I think there's going to be a, or, you know, we're already seeing sort of traces of a huge white black backlash to the fact of having, for example, a non-white vice president elect. Um, I don't think these things are just sort of handled very neatly. I think actually that just emboldens people who are Trump's space or are part of the Republican Party. Um, and the second point I would make about that is also it's helpful to keep in mind that the Republican Party, even the people, I guess, sort of uh, echoing a little bit what I was trying to say earlier, are very much supported, I mean, that the Republicans in Congress, rather, are very much supported by these insurrectionists, right? So even though the, they themselves were not insurrectionists, they're supported by the fact that they, you know, the people in Congress were still contesting the legitimacy of the election, right? And so those things have to be put in tandem. So it's not just the people who are walking around the Capitol with holding Confederate flags, it's also the people who are in, you know, suits and ties who are legitimizing that as a critique. And I think we're, that's not going, and I just don't, maybe I'm just cynical in this moment right now, given everything that's going on. I don't think that's going away. And another way to think about that as it relates to voter suppression it's also thinking about how the Republican Party is only going to be more emboldened to make sure that more minorities are not voting, which is like, so I, I would not be at all surprised if we see in heightened efforts for voter suppression, worse than we've ever seen, particularly thinking about how close the presidential, presidential election was and even how close the Georgia Senate runoffs are, were, excuse me. Uh, you know, I think we're only going to, I think the takeaway, frankly, just to be completely blunt about it for many Republicans is we just have to make sure fewer people vote, right? And I think we're going to just only see more and more efforts to that effect. So I actually, you know, sorry to be uh, super depressing, uh, but I actually don't think, um, I think the next couple of years, the next four years are going to be very challenging around some of these issues, because again, I think people, um, even after Biden's elected, are, st are still going to be emboldened. Um, to make sure that that you know whoever runs in 2024, uh, hopefully not a member of the Trump of the Trump family, uh, will not be elected, right? I don't think that's going away. Okay, and I think that leads nicely into another question from the audience, and it's perhaps you know appropriate rather than looking back at Trump, you know, at the end to look perhaps to the beginning. Uh, one one of the questions we is that uh, of course Joe Biden as the president elect is will be in tomorrow has. Uh, pledged to be a president who seeks not to divide, but to unite. So uh, how does he go uh, about that? And uh, what, what perhaps might your, your hopes and expectations of his presidency be? So uh, perhaps we will begin with Whitney this time. Oh, <laughs> I, um, 
So one of my jobs is as director of the W.E.B. Du Bois Center here at UMass. And um, I don't know, it's very hard for me to answer that question. I'm not say I, I, I can't, I'm not gonna say I'm a communist or anything crazy, because um, then that would be bad, right? Um, in the US, but it's, it's so hard to, to, I have hope, right? <laughs> But I, I have to admit, I, I think about um, the impact that this pandemic has had on our economy. I think about um, the disproportionate amount of, of Black and Indigenous folks who are dying from, um, uh, and, 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 and Asian and Latinx folk because we're on the front lines and um, probably be, you know, potentially be low down on the list of, of, of vaccines. And, and there's, I, for me, there's so much not to have to fix, but have to come to terms and, and to understand that we have a healthcare issue. We have, uh, you know, equity issue in terms of, of pay, in terms of all kinds of things. And, and it's, it's one thing for me in a, in a position of privilege as a university professor to, to, to study these things and to talk about them. But the truth is, is that I think that it's very hard to be progressive and understand that moderate is the only way to for people to win elections in this country. And it, it, it kind of, um, and it's not to say that I'm on the, 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 the far, far extreme, but, um, this, uh, the presidency, there's so much to fix in terms of Homeland Security, in terms of um, recategorizing the things that happened last Wednesday, uh, that happened last week. It was that, gosh, it seems so long ago. Um, um, but the, those kinds of things that happened and then we be able to name them as domestic terrorism, right? Or domestic terrorists, those kinds of, those kinds of back, you know, ins and back and forth, we shouldn't ever question those kinds of things. And so I really want the Biden administration to go further, right? And and to make sure that healthcare is not a privatized option. I know that's like so radical in this country, but the idea of private, again, it's like, how are we, how are the demographic shifts in this country are going to be affected disproportionately by moderate proposals of how to move the country forward. We are not going to um, understand that the amount of unemployment that we have here and $600 for each family is going to help when especially in, you know, where um, Jean is in California, there's extreme housing issues and crises that now there might be this complete overhaul and New York City is another place of eviction waves where people are going to be homeless. And, I, and, it, and it, these are the kinds of real on the ground things that I'm sorry, the, the, the storming of the Capitol was awful and, 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 and all of that, but you know, there's the everyday things that I think are only going to embolden these these radical white supremacist right, white supremacist groups to see the government as as failing or whatever and 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 be able to use that to not just continue the base but to in some ways broaden the base to people who are unsure and and I don't want there to be some kind of you know uh, second civil war that's not cool but it's just it, it's just so hard to think positively when we're trying to move, we're having like these baby steps to not to make sure that this doesn't happen and this doesn't happen. Baby steps are not gonna make it, right? We need to take bold actions, like big steps. And I'm not sure, you know, I don't know. We'll see, you know, how Biden takes those steps, but um, that's kind of my little fear there. Okay, and I can move on to Jean and perhaps kind of put that in, in, in context as well is that uh, obviously the kind of a window for any incoming president is often seen that their first hundred days is when that is their best chance to get things through. So 
Are there any kind of particular things you might be looking at that you might either say in his uh, inauguration address tomorrow or in terms of initiatives into during those first 100 days? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I would say, um, you know, one, I, I hope that the Biden administration does not make the same mistake that the Obama administration made, you know, Biden was part of that administration, in the sense of trying to, you know, meet people across the aisle or whatever this discourse is, right? And so I think we saw with the with with Obama's presidency that didn't work, right? He still was attacked as if he had this sort of radical socialist agenda. So what I really would love to see from the Biden administration. Um, is really making bold moves outside of what they think Republican, what's going to attract the Trump voters or the Republican base, right? So I think one, everything related to uh, COVID-19 in terms of vaccine distribution, I think he's mentioned um, sort of enforcing uh, people wearing masks, which has been, you know, haphazard at best in this country compared to other societies. I think it's really, really crucial. I think, again, like what Whitney mentioned about the issue of um, the sort of e present day economic crisis um, and how it rates, relates to housing insecurity, food insecurity, evictions. So I would love, and, and also just thinking about the sort of stimulus checks, but I would love if the if the Biden administration, you know, led with their own agenda and didn't worry about, you know, what the Republicans were saying. Like, I, I don't think that's going to happen because that's not how Democrats govern, which is why, among other reasons, I'm super frustrated with the Democratic Party. But like, ideally, in my, you know, that's the advice I would, I would give, uh, I would give Biden. Yeah. And uh, if I ask that same question to Heidi, any particular hopes, uh, expectations of Biden in the uh, address tomorrow or the, the first hundred days? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think I broadly feel like Gene and, and Whitney ab about these issues. I will say that one thing Obama perhaps made a mistake on is he did let a crisis go to waste back in 2008. And maybe, I mean, I don't know how big my you know hopes are. I'm a little cynical about all this as well. I like what Gene said that Biden should lead with his agenda, not cave into you know going across the aisle and all this. But maybe this is a moment, you know, with the so many crises at one time that he could that a real agenda that moves us towards equity and getting rid of racial disparities and things like health and housing uh, does something about immigration, legalizes all those folks who've been here. You know, that the, these kinds of major initiatives maybe can happen. I don't know. I'm just pessimistic with politics in the United States for so long. But this seems to me to be the moment, especially in the wake of all the chaos at the Capitol, to strike and and to do bold things like in policing, right? And and so, you know, that's that's what I'm looking for. And Biden says he's gonna do something on immigration right away. He's gonna get rid of the Muslim ban, you know, and and in a way, I just hope he keeps that equity lens. For me personally, healthcare is the most disgusting part about this society. I mean, it's just it is appalling that you know the supposedly richest country in the world has some system like this. So I I would hope that some of those efforts can happen. I'm you know I'm tense as as Whitney said. More than 70 million people voted for Trump, and that was after they knew about him. And the knife edge differences in the states, like where I am here in Georgia, it's it's tough. But I I, I you know I hope Biden and and Harris go bold. We'll we'll see. And uh, I guess a, a kind of a final question is that uh, Donald Trump himself described uh, over here in the UK uh, that our Prime Minister Boris Johnson is uh, Britain's Trump. Uh, quite a few of our European leaders also made that comparison, though not necessarily intending it as a compliment. Um, we've also had quite a few Black Lives Matter protests over here in the last year, particularly the tearing down of you know, statues of um, uh, of people who've been involved heavily in the slave trade. So, uh, basically, I, is there other things that um, that we can learn in in Britain from the, the Trump experience in America? So, perhaps beginning with Jean. Yeah, I think um, you know one thing that you know this, the last four years. Well, one of the many things the past four years have revealed to me, as a, as it relates to your questions, is how many of these phenomena are very global, right? So a lot of times, I mean, I didn't personally believe in American exceptionalism, but I think that like you know, hopefully that has put this uh, put that ridiculous idea to to waste because you know a lot of as you said, a lot of things that are happening in the UK are also happening in the United States, and that relates both in terms of sort of thinking about far right politicians and their effects, the effects of having 
far right public politicians, but also thinking about the sort of role of anti black violence as it's sort of sanctioned by the state. And so I think, you know, a lot of that times, I think what the last few years have revealed is how a lot of these phenomena, at least these that we've seen in the United States, are really global phenomena. And so I think if we think of beyond the sort of boundaries of the nation state, it'll be really fruitful to think about how we move beyond these oppressive structures. And I can ask the same question to, to Heidi. I, I mean, I, I broadly, you know, think the same way Jean does. We've seen that the same kinds of trends and and movements are happening across board. I mean, there's, you know, there was Brexit and the current prime minister in England, but we've also got, you know, far right populism surging in all kinds of places: Poland, Brazil, India. There's a broad sort of challenge from the right to diverse democracies that's emerging everywhere. And, um, and you know, I have to say, I, I, one of the things that I liked about the BLM protests spreading to places like France and England is it was a positive export from the US as opposed to QAnon spreading to places like that as a negative, um, a, a negative export from here. It seems like, you know, the one thing America might be exceptional at is, is pushing really bad ideas in other parts of the world lately, unfortunately. So, you know, to me, the be seeing, seeing the challenge of racism um, being taken on straight up in other countries is a, is a really good thing. And it, that needs to happen everywhere in different forms, obviously. There are different kinds of racism and hatred depending on where you are. And again, if I could ask that question to Jean, and perhaps particular, you know, things that we can learn from the Black Lives Matter protests, because there's been uh, the tearing down of statues, but we've also seen, I think, uh, um, uh, you know, in, in sport, uh, you know, uh, sportsmen taking the knee, standing up against racism when there's been racial abusing crowds. So uh, uh, you know, I ask that to Whitney. Oh, I thought you said Jean, sorry. Sorry, um, I'm not going to say it. Yeah. It's okay. Um, yeah, the, the, this uh, global phenomena is, is, and I think that Black Lives Matter is, is important. I mean, the first thing that I can think about, and, and I have to agree with Jean and Heidi on so many different levels, but for me, I think still it's been really hard to, um, it's been hard to see the ways in which Black Brazilians are experiencing state-sanctioned violence and and the idea, uh, the ideas of 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 the fear of becoming the Black nation, right? The fear of losing as uh, not just the majority in terms of population, but the majority in terms of power, and and the ways in which different places understand that there's a connection. Um, with um, anti-Black racism and the ways in which folks are disproportionately kind of um, the ways in which they pay for, for not being white or not be considered under the umbrella of white. And I don't think that it is a phenomenon that is strictly in the United States. I think that the ways in which the idea of the UK and, and, and the ideas of, you know, quote unquote, um, and I don't mean to be speaking out of turn, but the colonies coming back home, right? And, and, and I know that um, the couple of times I've been to England, um, I've been with people who are either from there or spent a lot of time there. And it's, it's amazing how much culture, right, that you get in terms of Sorry, I have uh, different people. I have three children on virtual school, sorry. Um, so that idea behind um, the, the colorfulness of, of kind of the, the, the settler colony, right? Like the ways in which we enrich, right? The lives of, of, of Britain, of the US, of, of Brazil, of all these places in which we have contributed and 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 I did forget to mention when I was talking about the 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 red states and the and the blue and all of this stuff I the one thing that really stuck out to me was Arizona and the idea that from the reservation from the the county that was almost entirely uh, uh, made up of Apache folk they shifted the tide and made sure that they secured it for Biden. And I think that we have to understand 
that there are folks that are not be haven't been counted in the past that even through their ability to vote are now trying to push and make for a change you want to be seen you want to be um appreciated you want to be a part of the mosaic that is the country in which your ancestors are from or in which your ancestors have been here way too long so i think that those kinds of 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 um have, uh, those kinds of issues are being reflected in the in the not just marching for black lives just for black people in the US but for people who are not under the umbrella or sanct or the, or the umbrella of privilege that is i think pretty universal so i think that these communities of the global majority which is which is not white see the Black Lives Matter movement as something that can cut across boundaries, borders. Okay, well, thanks very much for that. And, and thanks to all of our speakers. Uh, unfortunately, we are right now out of time. So apologies to uh, our, our questioners. I know there were a number of questions that, that have been posted uh, uh, on chat, which we've not had time to take. But uh, uh, once again, thanks very much to our three speakers for, for joining us. And what I'm sure everyone will agree, it's been a very stimulating uh, and very informative evening. And uh, I'm sure you know, this time tomorrow, we will all be uh, watching attentively as uh, Biden uh, is uh, sworn in uh, as president of the United States and uh, Donald Trump is playing golf in Florida or wherever. <laughs> okay, so thanks very much, everyone.